It's really important that I'm not thinking of others when I work, that it really means something to me. That's all that I'm looking for. I'm not trying to be clever. I let the work happen and then start to rummage around and find out what it means to me. Hi there, welcome back. It's difficult to give a one-liner about what type of photographer Nadav Kanda is, but there's a lot to be learned from his approach to the medium. He's probably best known for his portraiture of famous people and his essay on the Yangtze River in China. But he isn't strictly a portraiture photographer or a landscape photographer. His photographs are still and heavy. He uses that word. Looking at his work, you become aware of the person behind the camera. He's drilling down deep into himself and his subjects to discover a way of mirroring the emotions that he experiences in their presence. I think that the most valuable lesson that one can learn from him and his work is that as a photographer, it's up to you how far you want to go in interrogating your subjects. But I'll come back to this point later in the video. Kanda relentlessly strips away layers until he uncovers the essence of each interaction. For this video, I have selected work that broadly falls into the category of landscape photography, and I'll also delve into his distinctive approach to portraiture. They say that the camera never lies, but it can stretch the... Immediately when you look at his work on the Yangtze River, you become aware that there's something different going on here. Over two and a half years, he explored the river. He became aware that unlike other significant rivers around the world, like say the Mississippi or the Thames, the Yangtze takes on huge significance for the Chinese people. It winds its way through the vast country and in so doing becomes a symbol for what's unifying. It's become their mother figure and is integral to the history of the country. So Kanda was interested in the river's mythical status and what could be discovered about modern day China by exploring its banks. He could easily have gone for a National Geographic type style and documented life along the banks. Initially, he avoided defining a particular approach for the project. He wanted to develop a theme that mirrored his own reaction to what he saw and felt. I'm far more interested in seeing myself mirrored in pictures. I'm interested in my inner landscape more than what I focus on within my pictures. What impacted him the most was the pace and scale of change within the country. He became aware that China was mimicking the worst aspects of development within the West. It wasn't a critical take on Chinese culture, but a recognition that in their race to outdo the West, they've created a landscape that is out of step and sync with the country's inhabitants. For him, this picture sums up this idea most concisely. The smallness of man and the bigness of their ideas. How humans have been left behind by the pace at which change is happening. So his modern day portrait of the Yangtze becomes a metaphor for constant change. Within his images, the information that he displays is narrowed down to a minimum. He also steps back. He takes a broad view of his subjects, allowing us to become aware of how the structures dwarf the lives of the people that live alongside them. The environments have been transformed by these giant monuments to change and the people seem powerless and therefore insignificant. One gets a sense that Kanda has become aware of the real life consequences for a population living under autocratic rule. The government is free to make sweeping changes to the landscape without having to worry about pesky things like citizens and human rights. While talking about his project on the Thames estuary, he said something that I think is quite useful to consider if you're developing a series of photographs. 
it's a technique to distill what has actually attracted you to the subject matter. He says that he uses word association. So in the case of the Thames estuary, the words that came to mind for him included flat, slow, quiet, dissolving, ending, becoming insignificant, those kind of things. These words then guide him to how his photograph should feel. His next step draws on his deep knowledge of art. It involves building a scrapbook of paintings, photographs and artworks that for him sum up these words. For this project he was drawn to the work of Whistler and Rothko. So when he goes out to shoot he carries a mental picture of the images from his scrapbook. Not just how they look but how through their complexity they're able to convey emotions. He can then respond to these feelings by applying photographic tools. For him, composition is primary, followed by colour and tonal choices. He says that a strong composition communicates as much as literal information. The formal composition can add solidity to the work which is what I was starting to say to you. Composition can calm a picture, rendering it really quiet and still, which is something that is very important to me, and I don't know why. He was inspired to produce his dust project after learning about areas within the old USSR that had never been mapped. In 2006, Google found these places in Russia and Kazakhstan. They had been kept secret during the Cold War and he wanted to discover what these hidden nuclear tests and armament cities looked like and felt like. Kanda grew up during the 70s and 80s, so the Cold War and the Russian nuclear threat was a reality, pretty much like today. He photographed the structures that he saw as if they were discarded people unclothed and vulnerable within the desolate landscape. He was aware of how these feelings are universally part of the human condition, aging, fading away and destruction, but they can simultaneously display beauty. This then became the core theme of the essay. His portraiture might seem like a big departure from his landscape work, but there are strong parallels between them. He's exploring humankind as a whole, what our personal features or the structures that we build reveal about ourselves. In both his landscapes and his portraits, he's drawn to the fringes. Even when he's photographing someone who might be considered mainstream, He's always seeking the fringes of mood or emotion. With so many of these portraits, one feels that he's taking himself and his subjects to uncomfortable places. He believes that a successful portrait should inform, but at the same time evoke questions. Even when he's working with a well-known person, he wants to prick the bubble of celebrity and show that the human condition is common to everyone. He's not interested in flattering his subjects. He strongly believes that beauty is unachievable without imperfection. Unlike perfectly stylized fashion models, real humans naturally reveal their imperfections and fragilities. As a portrait photographer, he aims to spark a reaction within the viewer that suggests an emotion like vulnerability, envy, melancholy, happiness. It might outwardly seem that we connect verbally, but on a deeper level, it's always through emotions. He sees the process of making a portrait as a dance. The final image results from the colliding of two people with all of their life baggage. The outcome of this interaction between these two bubbles of human stuff is what the viewer is confronted with. They then add all of their baggage to form the final piece of the triangle of creative interplay. 
This is how he approaches the portrait session. His starting point is how people look. He Googles them before the shoot and looks at as many images as possible, slowly internalizing their features and general appearance. He's aware that our faces reveal so much about our life experience. Our features and general presence are molded in time. He uses his familiarity with the subject's appearance together with his emotional reaction to their presence. This then guides his photographic response through composition, lighting and colour. In this way, he exposes what sparks interest or an emotion within him. In the introduction to this video, I mentioned that one can learn from the depth of his engagement with his work. He takes seriously that he and the viewers of his work are operating on multiple levels. To make people stick with the complexity and depth of his work, he avoids explaining or revealing everything. So he's producing the opposite to those made-for-TV movies that are convinced that the viewers are dumb. So they wrap everything up neatly in the last few scenes, perhaps with a Morgan Freeman type voiceover, leaving nothing for the viewer to contemplate or unravel. So much of popular imagery displays everything in an instant. But Kanda wants his viewers to stick around. He makes them work hard to extract understanding and meaning. One of his major influences is the artist Francis Bacon, who is a master of provoking engagement and curiosity in the viewer by hinting rather than revealing. Sometimes he turns his subject's head away or distorts it. This opens doors in the viewer's mind as they start asking questions. Because Kanda purposely avoids any predetermined plan for the shoot, he has to adapt to the unknown. Almost as soon as I started photographing him, he didn't really show discomfort, but I don't think he's used to the idea that he's not in control, and so he asked for a camera. And while I was photographing him, he started photographing me. But as I stepped back, as I had a longer lens than him, he had a wider lens, he stepped forward, and so we played this cat and mouse going around his studio, which I thought was uh, and everybody else around was really funny. And he has a brilliant way of insulting you quite deeply, but you enjoy it. Another lesson that Kanda learned from Francis Bacon is how colour can be used to emphasise what's important to him. The colour of some of these portraits immediately affects us as viewers on an emotional or mood level and therefore reveals something of what Kanda was feeling at the time of taking the picture. There's a lot more of great work that I could show and talk about, but I think I'll leave it there. Please like and subscribe because it really helps the channel. Thanks for staying with me and I'll see you next time. Cheers. I think it's just so f much more exciting to work to work from a place of not knowing. The excitement of learning through the, the endeavor of taking picture after picture is for me what it's all about.